This is the second of two videos on section 5.2. In this video, I'll be talking about properties of integrals. So remember that we just talked about a definite integral, which is written like this, which represents the net area bounded by y equals f of x in the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. So one property of integrals that we can talk about is that if you have an interval from a to b, so the interval from a to b here, split up into two pieces, the interval from a to some point in the middle, let's call that p, and the integral from p to b, then the area from a to p, this area here, if I add that to the area from p to b, this area here, well then that's gonna add up to the entire area. So symbolically, we're gonna write it like this. The integral from a to b of my function f of x is the integral from a to p plus the integral from p to b. So it's a pretty simple concept, but just looks a little bit uh, intimidating when you look at it in the notation. But this is all this is saying, that if we stop at some point in the middle and we took, take the area to the left and the area to the right and add those together, that gives us the entire area. Also, if we have an integral that starts and ends at the same value of x, then that's going to equal zero. One way to think about this is that if I have some function, so here's my y equals f of x, well, if I start at a point a, and then I don't get go anywhere, right, then my region that I'm talking about is really just the, a little line segment, and that's not gonna have any area at all. So this is going to equal zero, because there's no area, because it didn't go anywhere. So I can combine those two properties to actually create a new property. Because if I go the integral from a to a of my function f of x, then that's going to equal the integral from a to b of my function f plus the integral from b back to a. Right, so I'm just using that principle that we can split up an interval into two pieces, but this time I'm going from a to b and then I'm going from b back to a. Now this integral here, we know that that's zero. So I'm going to subtract this integral from both sides. Actually, I'm gonna subtract this integral from both sides. And what that's gonna give me is that the integral from b to a, which we can sort of think of as a backwards integral, is the negative of the integral from a to b of f of x. So this means that we can switch the bounds on our integral, and what that does is it introduces a minus sign. So if we ever have a backwards integral, an integral where the upper bound is actually lower than the lower bound, then we can sort of correct that and uh, put the integral in the proper order by putting in a minus sign. Some more properties. Uh, if I multiply my function by, uh, by a constant, so if I multiply by some constant c, then that's gonna multiply the area by c. Uh, to try to think about why that might, might be, imagine that the number is two. So I'm multiplying my function by two, so all of my y values are gonna be doubled. And if we're thinking about a Riemann sum, all, that means all of the heights of my rectangles are gonna be doubled. Well, if I double the height of a rectangle, that's gonna double the area of that rectangle, which is going to be doubling the total. So again, sort of it seems intuitive, hopefully with the number two there, it really works for any constant c. And then if I take two functions and add them together, so if I've got f of x plus g of x, again, thinking about areas and rectangles, if the, the height of my function, if my y value is the sum of two functions, well, then that means that the area is gonna be the sum of the two areas. So if I've got two rectangles kind of stacked on top of each other, so this width is gonna be delta x like it normally is. And then let's say the height of this function is g of x, and I'm adding on top of that f of x, well, then the area of this rectangle is going to be f of x times delta x. The area of this rectangle is going to be g of x times delta x. And so the area of the big rectangle is going to be f of x plus g of x times delta x, if I factor out the delta x. So again, trying to understand a little bit intuitively about why these properties work. Okay, so here's a summary of all the properties that we talked about. Again, breaking up our integral and in, uh, interval into two subintervals. The uh, integral when we start and end at the same point equaling zero. The idea that we can switch the bounds on our integral and that brings in a minus sign. Multiplying by a constant multiplies the area and then adding two functions adds the area. So these are the properties that we're gonna be talking about and I'm gonna work through several examples now for how we can put these into practice.
Okay, so let's suppose we have a function here, and we don't know a formula for this function, um, and we don't know what these x values are, but we are given some areas. And so I want to evaluate the area from a to c of this function. So that means I'm going to start at a, and I'm going to end at c. Well, one of my properties says that I can break that up into the interval from a to b and the interval from b to c. And what they tell me is that the area from a to b, that's 20, and the area from b to c, well, the area of that shape is 12, and remember that because that area is below the x-axis, that's going to count negatively towards my total. Remember, we're talking about net area here. And so my total here is going to be 8. Remember, any area that lies below the x-axis, those rectangles are going to have negative values that we think of as the height of that rectangle, and so those rectangles are going to contribute negative to my total. All right, what about the integral from b to d? Same idea. We're going to start at b, we're going to end at d. So we're going to break this up into the integral from b to c of my function, plus the integral from c to d of my function. Again, the integral from b to c, that's negative 12. And the integral from c to d, that's going to be 15, positive 15 because it's above the x-axis. Add those together, I get 3. All right, what about the integral from c to c? Well, if we start at c and then we don't go anywhere, we're not going to get any area, and so that's just going to be 0. How about the integral from b to a? So we're starting at b, and we're going backwards, and we're going to a. So whenever we have a backwards integral, we can fix it by reversing the bounds and putting in a minus sign. So now this integral is no longer backwards. This area is above the x-axis, so that's positive area. But then the negative sign that we had to put in to switch it gives us an integral of negative 20. All right, what about the integral from a to b of 2 times f of x? Well, one of our properties says that that's just going to be 2 times the integral from a to b. The integral from a to b, that's this area here, which is 20. 2 times 20, that works out to be 40. One last example. What about the integral from a to d of the absolute value of f of x? We didn't talk about this as a separate property, but what's that absolute value going to do? Remember that the absolute value of a number is the same as that number when, the, when that function is positive, but it's going to bring in a minus sign. It's going to make the negative numbers positive if the number happens to be negative. So let's first break this up. We're starting at a. We're going all the way over to d. So I'm going to break this up into three separate pieces. The integral from a to b of this absolute value, the integral from b to c of this absolute value, and the integral from c to d of this absolute value. So from a to b, my function is positive, which means this is just going to be the same. Nothing's going to happen to that function when I take the absolute value from a to b. But from b to c, my function is negative, so the absolute value is going to put a minus sign in front of that to make it positive. So this number right here, it looks like it's negative because I put in a minus sign, but this is actually positive because what I did is I put a minus sign in front of numbers that are negative. These y values in here from b to c, those are negative y values. So by putting in another minus sign, that makes them positive. And then finally, from c to d, nothing's going to happen again because my function is positive from c to d. So from a to b, I just get my area of 20. From c to d, I just get my area of 15. What about from b to c? Well, that negative sign is going to put in a minus sign. And then it's going to be the integral from b to c, which is negative 12. So it's going to be negative negative 12, or in other words, positive 12. So basically what that absolute value is doing is it doesn't do anything to the positive area, but it makes any negative area that we have, it turns that into positive area. So we get 20 plus 12 plus 15, which is 47.